Welcome, everyone. I see lots of participants joining us. If you are just joining us, um, do me a favor and just drop in the chat where you are joining us from. We always like to see um, where from all over the world people join these webinars from. We're so excited. France, Virginia. I'm going to France this summer. I live in Virginia. Love it. Okay. Austin, Texas, London, Florida, New Hampshire, Albuquerque, BC, Central Ohio. Monterey, Brooklyn. Oh my goodness. Montreal, Canada. Wonderful. Baltimore, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Milwaukee, Modesto, Toronto, SoCal, Milwaukee. Oh my gosh. So Nebraska. Wow. So many, lots of, lots of folks from all over. I love seeing that. Vancouver, Wurtsboro, New York. Yes, thank you, Barbara. Uh, my friend Barbara from Bravely just posted in the chat. Um, just a quick tip, please set your chat to everyone so we can see your comments. Um, we have our team from Bravely, Joni and Barbara, who are going to be taking a look at the chat and I'm um, going to be taking a look at it today as well. My name is Natalie Garamone. I'm a Bravely coach and I'm here today with Hans Kohler and Shireen. And uh, we are so excited. I'm going to let them do intros in a little bit but we are going to um, get started. We'll just wait a couple more minutes for everyone to join us and then we'll officially kick it off. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, Phoenix, Arizona, Madison, Nashville. Yes, please add questions to the Q&A section of the Zoom panel as we go along. We still have lots of people joining, 296, 97 people. So grateful to have everyone here today. All right. All right. Welcome, welcome, Kentucky, y'all. All right. Wonderful. Well, it's 102 on the East Coast, but I know that's a different time for everyone. I'm so grateful that everyone is here. Oh, I just saw a fellow Richmond, Virginia. Wonderful. As you know, um, as you may know, but if you don't, I'll tell you right now, our Bravely coaches, we have a wonderful network of Bravely coaches all over the world. And so it makes us so happy to see people joining us from all over the place. All right. We have a question um, in the chat, Barbara. Someone wants to know if we are going to be sending the PowerPoint afterwards, and I am going to answer this live, and I'm going to let um, my Barbara and Joni, yes, we are, they say. We're going to be sending out the PowerPoint. Okay, everyone, I would love to get started. It looks like it's slowed down a little bit. We have 357 people today here. Oh my gosh, 360. I'm going to stop counting now because I feel like if I keep counting, we're going to be here all day. And I want to make sure that we are being um, respectful of everyone's time. We're so grateful for you to be here. Let's get started. Like I said, my name is Natalie Garamone. I am so grateful to be here on behalf of Bravely as a Bravely coach. And I am here with Shireen El Macy, Director of People and Talent at Blueboard, and Hans Kohler, a fellow Bravely coach and conflict resolution specialist. And we are here today to talk about how you can create a culture of appreciation, mentorship, and connection, and drive real impact for your people and your business. 
Hans and Shireen, I want to um, give you a chance to introduce yourself. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we are going to make sure that you leave today with some actionable strategies and insights on how you can start fostering that sense of belonging, recognize employees with meaning, and invest in their development and coaching to create connections, especially in the hybrid work environment that we are all working from today. Hans, why don't you start us off and share a little bit about yourself? Great, absolutely. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Hans Kohler. I am originally from Brazil, but I have lived in the U.S. for many, many years. Um, I am a conflict resolution specialist. Uh, who I'm also an ombuds. I'm also a mediator and a coach. And I have been working with Bravely for, I would say, three years now. Um, my focus has always been how to deal with interpersonal relationships and how those relationships can actually foster uh, in general by preventing conflicts. Let's just not fix it. Let's try to prevent it. You know, that would, that would be a good idea. And uh, relationships with yourself, which is intrapersonal conflicts. Um, those are the ones you usually look, like to look, focus on. And I have worked in many, many different areas from the United Nations to private companies, to organizations, to drug and alcohol, to mental health, uh, to several different areas, uh, including companies and organizations. So hopefully today I'll be able to give you some tools and direction on how to create that collaboration through belonging and connection. Thank you so much, Hans. I really love hearing that context. And I'm so glad that our participants get to understand a little bit about you as a human being before we get started today. Shireen, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm super happy to be here and um, excited for our, my conversation with Hans here. Thanks, Natalie, for facilitating for us. I know I've got some cats here in the house with me, so they might join our party, which will be exciting. Um, but I'm Shereen L. Macy. I'm the director of people and talent here at Blue Board. I actually hit my one year anniversary with Blue Board yesterday, which is super exciting. And I'm happy to be here. Um, I really focus on partnering not only with the employees at the company, but also the business to have a holistic understanding of how to best support the people in the organization. Uh, it's also really cool to work for a company that's focused like their offerings and services are focused on people. So it feels meta at times to be in this position and still part of this organization. Um, I have been in talent acquisition as a specialty of my human resources for almost nine years and have been in human resources for six now. Really exciting. I come from a psychology background. So Hans, I get super interested in all the things you say, says they make me really excited. So I'm happy to be here. I think it's going to be a good conversation and we'll have a good time. Thanks for having me. Yes. So excited. Thank you. We have some meows and some cat fans uh, in <laughs> yeah. the chat. Thank you all for sharing that. We love knowing about the people we're working with. Um, and finally, I'm Natalie Garamone. Uh, I'm a Bravely coach. My background is in organizational development, change management, and culture strategy. And like Hans, I also specialize in conflict resolution. I'm a certified mediator as well. And I love facilitating conversations and moderating panel discussions with experts like these two today, because I know they're going to share such great insights about the topic that we are here to talk about. So I'll start off with a little bit of context, and then Hans, I have a question for you to get us going. The U.S. Surgeon General recently announced that Americans are in an epidemic of loneliness. After everything that we've experienced over the past few years, this probably isn't all that shocking, right? But it is a little bit concerning. Um, beyond individual impact, the sense of loneliness and isolation has a profound and can have a profound impact, we know, on worker performance, engagement, and productivity. So Hans, I'm curious to know your thoughts. Start us off. Why do you think an epidemic of loneliness has become such a significant issue? And how does that sense of isolation impact employee performance, engagement, and or productivity? Of course. Um, I do think that we are passing through that type of epidemic of loneliness. Uh, because when you go back to when this, the, the pandemic started, everybody was saying, keep your distance, keep your distance, keep your distance, keep your distance. Keep your distance. And all of us kind of struggled through that. And then eventually keeping distance was something a little bit more natural. 
Um, and then something that a lot of us found out on the distance was that alone time, the time for yourself, the time to not need to have face-to-face -face or not need to have so much energy change with so many people, etc. So when that time became safe that we have to reconnect again, I think none of us knew how to. I think none of us were ready to say, okay, let's reconnect. But like, this feels really weird. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to go there and just like approach someone and say, hey, let's have a coffee. Let's do this. And so I think that that difficulty on now we had to learn how to distance ourselves. And then now we have to learn how to connect again. And a lot of us don't know how to do that anymore. And I think on top of that, a lot of us actually found out a lot of things about us that is actually not that positive. And I'll tell you what it is. Um, a lot of us in solitude or in loneliness, in those isolated states, we feel very comfortable. And that comfortability, it's very difficult for you to step out of it. But as, as, as I think like every psychology probably would agree with me, it's like that place of isolation will develop into loneliness, which will develop into many other things that is not going to allow you to have that productivity, that engagement, that everything else that you're looking for. So how to connect with someone, it's not as simple as before. Uh, and how to connect with someone is not as simple as before for, for us, because now we want to connect in a different way. And we have to learn how to reconnect with people too. Yeah. Um, so I do think that that is like something that is very real. And a lot of us are too comfortable in that isolation statement. Uh, we are too comfortable in that loneliness, but we are all in the end craving to have some sort of belonging. Not it's not necessarily a physical belonging, I would say, but it is belonging, belonging nonetheless. Really yeah. well said. Shireen, yeah. anything you Want to add? Yeah, I can add a little bit. I mean, absolutely what Hans is saying. I'm a great example of that. Um, but what I've recognized more recently is how businesses are being able to support that loneliness and what that looks like. I think we've had to really leverage digital tools to be able to increase engagement a lot of organizations are discussing return to office, you know, opportunities and hybrid environments. And that's causing a lot of resistance for people who have felt more comfortable in their home offices and now needing to relearn, like Hans is alluding to, relearn how to communicate, how to have that real life water cooler talk and not just the question of the day through Slack. It's become a really different ask that businesses are also trying to encourage, right? We do see higher productivity and questions answered quickly in positions that are highly collaborative and work with cross-functional leaders. It sometimes can take a couple of minutes to hours to get a response to a quick question. And what you see with that as it relates to productivity is I actually, let me position this differently. I think productivity can look different for different things. How are we highly product productive when we're working independently? Sometimes the answer to that is being at home. It is being heads down. It is being in a quiet environment, but sometimes productivity also looks like collaboration. And so how are businesses and how are we as individuals leaning into that collaboration piece and what does that look like? Because as Hans is saying, people need people. And so when we work with each other, we're able to connect. You can feel the sense of belonging and ultimately your engagement, your interest, your connectedness can increase productivity. So I think it's a holistic lens on so many things that we are having to currently relearn. I think we're getting closer, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate hearing that from the both of you and really making that, um, creating that visual for us about how we swung so much in one direction, like you said, Hans, to really almost becoming so comfortable with being on our own. But now we're starting to see some of the effects of that 
to your point, Shireen, businesses are starting to say, okay, what is the right balance here that mm -hmm. we need to strike to provide opportunities for connection and engagement and meet business goals? Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that you brought up companies because I also want to ask um, a to both of you, how, talk to me a little bit about the role of company culture more specifically in combating kind of this epidemic of loneliness. How can we create a culture of appreciation and connection to, to really address this? Okay. Um, I do think that I do have to say one thing before I jump into that is like, um, if you notice, like a lot of leaders constantly put it something in our minds, which is you need to have autonomy, you have to have autonomy, you have to have autonomy. And that culture of autonomy was something that we always had. But when you have the isolation with autonomy, that person doesn't ask for help. No, nope. uh, that person does not collaborate. That mm -hmm. person's constantly trying to do themselves because, you know, I don't want to ask someone else because it may take a while, it may take to do this. So like that sense of autonomy needs to have a different approach today. We have to focus on autonomy in a collaborative way, not an autonomy as you can do those things without me. Because because uh, like at, as I'm coaching leaders, I tell them, you need to delegate. I say that, I don't know how many times a day. Uh, I say, you need to delegate. You need to delegate. You need to delegate. And many times they think that delegating is abandoning them. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Delegating is you giving that opportunity to that person, but you're still supporting them. Mm -hmm. You're going to support that person while giving them visibility, power, uh, sense of self, all those stuff. And a lot of people forget that, 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 forget that those things are different. Like there's a, a lot of dichotomies on those terms, right? Um, so the collaboration has to be 100% the necessity but there are things inside that you need to modify a little. So if someone is isolating, how can I pull them out of isolation to start collaborating is important. If someone is feeling lonely, can you, can, uh, one thing that I would say is like, can you feel lonely in a, in a room full of people? And the answer is yes, yes. And that's where the sense of belonging is because you have to teach these people around you to not be lonely in a room full of people. Right. Um, and learning that is actually and modifying that is actually really important because if I am lonely in a place, do you really think I'm gonna do my my best? Yeah. I'm probably not gonna give a fuck, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, with all the respect. But it, it is that feeling that you have because you're so deep down in that trench that that's how you feel. Totally. You don't want to try. You don't want to do. You don't want to do your best. You're gonna do the bare minimum. Yeah. yeah. So important. I really appreciate, sorry, Shireen. I'm, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate the, the lens through which um, you're, you're showcasing the company culture and how, and it may be a good reflection for those of us in the webinar to say, what is my company culture, cultural ideals around autonomy or collaboration and just starting to really examine those, especially for those in leadership positions. Go ahead, Shireen. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, to my thought is tying both of what the two of you are saying together. I think that when we're relearning something, when we're having a culture shift or some sort of change, it needs to be number one priority to set expectations. And I think that's something that companies can do to increase connection in loneliness. So using Han's example about autonomy, okay? what is the expectation of autonomy? Does autonomy mean you're going to work by yourself all day, every day? Or does autonomy mean that once we collaborate, we break apart and we want you to be autonomous in self-starting and autonomous in running your own project management and minding your time management? Or does, or is the expectation that autonomy is you're on your own, kid? You know, like what is autonomy mean and what is the expectation around that? So in your question of how can companies really address this, I, I really believe that expectations and communication strategies need to be at the like front of mind in really ensuring like, what are we expecting out of our team during this time? And what are we going to be doing to ensure that we're setting those clear expectations so that we can create a culture and community of belonging? So 
that's kind of like my first thought. My next thought around your question of appreciation is that can just look so different in so many different ways. And I, I've learned by le working with Blueboard that individuals really love private appreciation, public appreciation. That can also support isolation and whatnot. Are we publicly praising people in a way where they can be celebrated by others? Do they prefer to be privately appreciated and what does that look like? So I think how you recognize your team and what that looks like is going to be really important in creating that sense of belonging and helping individuals not feel so alone in their environments. And uh, I want to add to that. And, and for example, in terms of uh, it is clear that the thing that we miss the most is appreciation and recognition in, in our companies. And since it became so much more hybrid, so much more um, online and remote, et cetera, all of us have been appreciated less. Or, or all of us have been, um, I would say, revered a little bit less. And, and I'll explain when I say that. Because like back in the day when we were in the office and you did something good, every time that you pass by someone, that person say, oh, hey, Hans, that was nice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that, that very little uh, and quote unquote insignificant recognition that I received, insignificant praise that I received was something that filled my pot a little bit every time. And when you do that, something nice, and then there's 10 people saying that, like I leave feeling, oh, sh I did something good. I did something good today. You know, I'm feeling good about myself. So the thing is, when you are only communicating through Slack, through teams, through emails, all of us are very formal. Mm -hmm. So do you really think that you're gonna receive, hey, good for you, we rocked it. Like, it's not so simple. And many times, I don't know how you guys are with Slacks and Teams, but for me, I read a uh, 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 good, good job on Teams and it, it goes over my head really, really fast because I, I, I read that before. It's something that just becomes accustomed. Mm -hmm. um, so we miss that feeling, the personal touch, the personal moment that it's just for you, something that really helps, really makes you feel and be be real uh, instead of the manufacturer ones. I'm talking about the, the be real kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, does that apply to everybody? No, it doesn't apply to everybody. There's people that will prefer more that um, email of saying like, hey, you did a, such a good job. And it's true. Each person will have a, a different thing. However, all of us miss recognition and appreciation. No matter who you are, all of us are feeling that we're doing things that are not being recognized for. Yeah, and I I really appreciate kind of the the overarching theme that's bubbling up around really understanding the unique needs of individuals and identifying how people want to best or that, that they feel they want to be recognized or appreciated or don't um, and what that what that could look like. Shireen, tell me a little bit. I know you're very well versed in, in the recognition space. So tell me a little bit. We know that recognition is critical for employee engagement as we're hearing both of you talk about. What is recognizing recognizing employees with meaning and in a genuine way to Hans's point look like in practice? It's, I'm excited to answer this question because I get to like shine light on how incredible my, the company like Blueboard is and how great our marketing team is also, you know, in understanding the answer to your question. We recently rolled out something called the Blueboard method and the Blueboard method comes alongside a workbook and the Blueboard method will encompass different forms of recognition. Before I go into that, I want to say like our offering is unique because it's it can be so personalized and it can be catered to the individual, not only by the experiences that are used through re rewards, but also how it's happening. So the Blueboard method is broken down into three different types of recognition. You have your informal day-to-day -day recognition. There's, we here at Blueboard use a peer-to-peer -peer shout out tool. This is a lot of what's already being discussed of verbal recognition, Slack, good jobs, all hand shout outs. You know, you have those everyday types of recognitions that you can offer. 
there's also formal recognition, which is a little bit more expected. So in formal recognition, you know, you're looking at anniversary recognition and saying, you know, I hit my one year yesterday, I got a blue board reward. I've been looking at our experience menu for like 24 hours, excited to use it. Um, and then lastly, we have, um, oh, I think I did this in a different way, excuse me. The bottom of the blue board method is our day-to-day -day appreciation. You then have uh, informal appreciation and formal appreciation. Informal is where you get to start uh, recognizing individuals for their performance and or employee referral bonuses or whatever that may look like. What I'm getting at here is that there are so many different ways to recognize at different times in the employee journey and the employee experience. And what's really cool is that with something like Blueboard, it's giving a unique offering where, you know, the chat was talking about introverts, for example, right? Like you can offer private recognition and then have the individual redeem a Blueboard reward. That's like learn a new language. And that's something that can be done at home without socializing with others, right? So it's really cool that there are so many different ways to recognize. And Joni just shared the Blueboard method in the chat. So I highly recommend that you go check it out, read up on our five A's. Recognition is not just either gift cards or Slack shout outs. There's so many things that can go into play. They can be public, they can be private, and they can be tailored to your individual. I'll close with, in order to tailor it to your individual, you have to know your team. Yes. You have to ask questions. You have to know what they like to do, how they like to be recognized, you know, and, and what value you can bring to them by asking them questions of like, mm -hmm. I want to celebrate you. How can I do that? And like, I don't think anyone would be opposed to that type of question. So all of that to say, it, th you can have a more structured way by following the Blueboard method, which is all awesome, but just knowing who you're talking to and how to celebrate that person can go a very long way. Excellent. Thank you so much. We had, I'm just going to call out a couple of questions that you have answered, Shireen, but someone asked them for clarification on the Blueboard method. So just a reminder that that's in the chat. And then someone had also asked, um, what are ways to engage people who may have social anxiety that allows them to be involved while still under understanding and respecting their unique needs? And um, it sounds like Blueboard has a variety of, and what you're kind of suggesting are there's so many different options. And it's critical that we take the time to understand those unique mm -hmm. needs and, mm -hmm. and um, desires for recognition um, mm -hmm. on our teams. Excellent. Hans, anything that you would add um, or anything that um, so feels- do, do, do we need to answer that, that question? No, I was just saying that Shireen did a, did a great job of kind of okay. starting to highlight some of that. Um, I do have one, one yeah. comment of that. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'm a neurodivergent. So of course the way I receive, I receive recognition, it's different. It's not the same. It's not like everybody else's. So for example, if you just came, Hey, you did such a good job. It doesn't work for me because it doesn't hit my dopamine the way it needs to be hit. Or maybe I just think that you're faking it. You know, it's like, really, I think mm, this is bullshit. Uh, because how many of us probably felt like that, that your boss just saying it just because you know? Um, and the thing is, like, if that's the case, I, my, I have to manage up to tell my boss certain things. Like, for example, I always tell my boss, don't tell me to do things on meetings because I will forget. Uh, write them to me and then I can actually make it happen. I'm just giving one manage up example. Um, but for me, for example, if someone, if I feel that the person on a meeting say, hey, you did such a good job and I felt nothing, I have to start thinking, when do I feel it? Oh, I feel it when my boss does X, Y, or Z. You know what? So I have to say this X, Y, Z and come to my boss and say, look, the best ways to make me feel recognized and appreciated is you doing X, Y, or Z. That's when it hits the spot. I love that. I think this is such a great call out that we can spend time asking questions as leaders and managers, but it's it has to be reciprocal. We have to be one, have that level of self-awareness that we can reflect on what types of recognition do feel most meaningful and genuine mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. and be able to articulate that to the people who we hope recognize us, right? So I think that's mm -hmm. such an important point. Hans, um, 
I also am curious to know where's part, you mentioned the um, kind of skill development around the language, Shireen. So I want to run with that a little bit. Yeah. Let's talk about employee development and coaching. Hans, how can organizations really take time to invest in employee development and coaching to create connection? And why is that support important? And I'm also going to throw an extra little nugget in here because someone posed it in the Q&A. What if you don't have a few, a huge budget? So yeah, keep sure. um, that, that's an also, also in consideration. Sure. I, I do think, for example, Bravely has that resource very well because all of us, all the all of the coaches at Bravely, we do have a lot of specialties. And even, for example, Bravely has something called Identity Match that you can actually match with someone who has same background, same ethnicity, okay. same... Like, for example, I have a lot of gay Latinos that actually come to me and my experience and their experience is very similar. So I can coach them more tailored to their experience. Um, does that mean that I, I, I cannot coach anybody else? No, I can coach everybody as well as someone white can coach someone who's Latino. That's not not it. But when it is someone that you you do have those commonalities, we do have a few nuances that people understand a little bit better. It's a little bit more clear. It's something that I, I was actually talking with Shireen about it. I uh, was someone say, yeah, you just have to create boundaries with your mom. And like, they don't know how my mom works. My mom was like, she would cross here. She would break my door and say, what the heck is wrong with you? I forgot about your mama. I, I heard that. I've heard that one before, by the way. So it is something that I definitely have to keep in mind. So coaching in organizations is to learn how to empower other people. So me as a coach, I'm constantly thinking, how can I help you to help yourself to achieve whatever you want to achieve? Many times uh, the, the role of the coach is someone who's going to guide you to go to different directions, but also someone that is going to hear what you want to say and challenge every perspective. Mm-hmm. Challenge to see if you really want it. Is this really what I'm looking for? Or, or many times what happens to me a lot, people say, I want to get here, this is what I want. And then when I'm coaching, 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 it's like, oh, this is not good enough. I can go up there. Yeah. And then I can help them to realize that I can, it can be bigger than this. I don't need to settle for less. I don't need to do all of that. And that empowerment is actually really contagious because eventually that empowerment is that person is going to give to their colleague, is going to give to their boss, is going to give. And when you see there's like so much that is actually being around. So the, the, the power of having coaches, the, the organizations to invest in coaching is to make your employees feel more supported when many times they don't have support. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that your manager is shitty. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that maybe your manager is too busy and uh, that person doesn't have someone to bounce ideas with and they bounce with us. And that's very true, especially now I've noticed in this shortage or hiring freeze and all of that, a lot of my calls is related to that. Oh, they cut my department by 30%. So I don't have that conversation that I can have with someone. So I'm I'm using you to have that conversation. Uh, I'm also using you because you have a third party perspective, right? You're seeing some, it's someone that is not involved in the drama of the of the department or of the company, whatever. Um, so the the coaching aspect uh, inside of our organization is also good for me to many times instruct a manager to how to be a coach, mm-hmm. to show them this is not the, the best way of doing it. Like, well, have you thought about doing this way? And when you change this way, what happens? And that manager becoming a better coach, like like I said before, like me telling them, delegate, 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 uh, that teaching them how to delegate. And then uh, I've, I've heard that one actually this week. They said, oh, you told me so many times to delegate that I told my manager to delegate. Then they tell the, their coordinator to delegate. And they told them to, because I, I told the VP to delegate. And then it was just trickling down. And then in the end, it became much more smoother with so much more visibility in the entire chain of command. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that I know is so important, and especially Hans and the type of work that you and I do around conflict is how am I, and I know it's so critical in coaching, how am I cultivating that objectivity to see the situation from a different lens 
to develop myself in a different way, to learn about what's most important to my manager, my leaders, the organization. So sometimes we're so close to a situation that it's really hard to zoom out and say, here's what's really important and here are the next steps I need to take. Shireen, any thoughts on the um, investment in employee development and coaching to create that connection? Um, Sure. And I think it'll tie it into some actionable steps that can be taken as well. So um, Hans's background in coaching, I can't match that. So I think that everything that you said is very valuable in encouraging others to be their best selves. Um, Pivoting a little bit to focusing on employee development. So Blueboard has a learning and development program where every April, so let me preface really quick. I'm about to share a program we have here internally, and I'm going to give options if you're unable to invest from a financial perspective, something you would be able to do, because I know that's top of mind a little bit of what do we do if we don't have the budget? So I'll talk a little bit about that. So with our learning and development program, every April, we go through a development roadmap. And this is, I think, where some of Hans's coaching can come into play. We're looking at um, the employee strengths, their opportunities, their short-term vision, and their long-term career vision. And through going through that every April, we then have a learning and development stipend. So we offer up to $1,000 per year for employees to find resources online that align with what came out of their development roadmap, conversations, coaching opportunities, whatever that looks like. Sometimes a coach is actually what people use their learning and development stipend for. With that said, one of the really cool things that we do is once people have identified what resources are best for them, we circulate those internally. So I'm speaking more to employee development from maybe more of a tangible skill set, but again, coaching is absolutely part of this. So if an employee has used their learning and development stipend for a program, we put it into something called a resource hub, and we allow that resource hub to be available to everyone in the organization. So sometimes this can be free courses online, this could be... um, different videos that they saw, books that they read. So if you don't have a large budget that you get to put towards employee development, my recommendation is how can you circulate what people are using for their development company-wide and then get individuals to feel that they can have access to those resources. So that's the, the actionable aspect of employee development that I think not only can I offer from experience, but Blueboard actively has in play. I really appreciate that, Shireen. And we are getting a lot of comments and questions around like, I don't have a recognition budget. I am we we have a small budget for these types of things. And one of the things that I'm hearing you say and hearing you both say is there are opportunities when we talk about the idea of connection and combating loneliness at organizations, just sometimes utilizing the tools that are in place. Um even a message sometimes, even a, a an offer of connection through our typical forms of engagement like email or Slack. And I know Hans, you and I had chatted a little bit about that um, in preparation for this um, for this webinar. But um, any any let's talk about kind of actionable steps that you think HR leaders can take to achieve that type of connection and feel free to also call out any challenges because we know there are always some challenges in implementing stuff like this. Do you want to go first, Shireen, or me? I mean, I think I can tie it back to what I just shared a little bit. Um, That was a very much of an intentional, actionable thing that we did. Um, Quite frankly, going through a development roadmap where you're talking through strengths, opportunities, short-term vision, long-term vision, that does cost time, but it doesn't cost money. Right. So that's a great way to even just start similar to what Hans alludes to and speaks to in his coaching is, are you challenging your team members to do self-reflection, to think about what are my strengths as a person? What are my opportunities as a person? And I do this with my friends all the time. It's like notorious that at Shireen's house, you might walk into a whiteboarding session, but I challenge my friends to think through their plans and their goals. I have friends who will reach out to me and say, hey, can I come over for a whiteboarding session? And I'm like, hell, yes, of course you can. 
Or I um, also have the other side of it where I might have friends not reach out to me for a couple of months because they're not in the mental state to be able to sit down and plan. As managers and as HR professionals, we ha have the opportunity to offer that coaching to people. And it's part of the gig. It's part of the job to be a coach, to help your employee develop. So your employee can't run from you and be like, Shereen, now's not the time. Instead, it's like, hey, I'd like to have you think through your vision a little bit. That's a great actionable item that does not cost, you know, a lot to do. It does cost your time. It does cost intentional conversation, but it's a great way to just start to have your employee think through how is the job that I'm doing today going to help me for where I want to go? Do I even know where I want to go? And how can my manager help me get through that? How can my company support me to develop in those ways? Okay. Uh, and for me, I would say something that um, it's really... It's really, it's very interesting perspective because me, for example, I'm Latino, I'm gay, I'm neurodivergent, so I have a lot of minorities involved. I, even though I'm white-bodied, being Latino in, the, in America, you still have some differences. Um, so I would say like you have to get to know the person that you're talking to without traditionalizing uh, who they are. So for example, if the person come and it's someone like from someone like me that is gay, but it says, yeah. Yes, yes, and like it has all these things. Uh, should you actually think that the person is saying yes to everything? Are they celebrating? Are they like crossing a line? Are they doing X, Y, or Z? So, for example, if you if you are actually dealing with someone who has threats, I don't know if anybody has met someone with threats before. Um, and then they say something that is inappropriate, something that just slip up, something that's sad. So, how are you going to deal with that situation? Uh, if you're talking with someone who is extremely serious, you probably have to think about that. If you're talking with someone who is a little bit more informal, someone who is younger, someone who's older, someone. So it is important to think about as leaders, how can I adapt and how can I actually be empathizing to the person that I'm listening or you know, thinking or hearing or learning from? So, for example, my style is a style that is very informal. I say the way I need to say it, how I need to say it. I saw some of the comments. Um, it's because that's my style. That's who I am. That's part of my mental health realization. That's how I do things. But it doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm talking about. It doesn't mean that I don't have a degree from Columbia University. It doesn't mean any of that. Uh, but a lot of us would make those assumptions. So as leaders, when you are dealing with that person, you kind of need to know what is going on. Why are they acting like this? Why are they thinking like this? Is this something that always happens? Are they this or that or whatever? So it is important to think about that too, for sure. Um, and all of us in general would do struggle with that because it, that creates too many variables. And leading with empathy, it's not simple because leading with empathy, you also need to be assertive. Because if I am too empathetic, the person may walk all over me. Uh, so how can I be assertive and empathetic at the same time is actually quite challenging for mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. So as leaders, as HR leaders, as leaders in general, teaching and learning how to be assertive and empathetic is definitely something important for us to really practice. Yeah. I've... Go ahead, Shereen. No, I'm agreeing. I don't have anything to say. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I want to, I have one more question. I know we're coming close to time and I want to make sure we leave some time also for any final um, Q&A or to answer some of the questions that are being shared. Um, but it sounds like really as, especially as leaders in the HR function, being able to one, take the pulse of the organization. Where are we with loneliness in our organization? Where are we making real strides in creating connection or understanding the landscape within which employees are operating within? Are we back to the office? Are we totally remote? Are we working in a hybrid environment? And what are we doing in each of those areas to understand what our employees need, understand what our leaders and managers, as so many comments in the chat um, mentioned, what they need, and understanding how we can best support them, whether that's through recognition efforts, whether it's through coaching and development, whether it's providing resources. So it sounds like really understanding what's happening, identifying individual needs, 
and then bigger company needs as well could be a real, real supportive um, action item and step. Um, I'm curious to know, and this question's for both of you, what future trends or shifts do you foresee in the area of employee engagement? I know there's something new every day to consider and put out there. Um, and I saw a question in the chat um, from Mo. We are going to let y'all know if you are interested in Blueboard and Bravely, which are great resources. We're going to share you um, share some resources with you at the end to tell you exactly how you can get connected. But what future trends or shifts do you foresee in the area of employee engagement, belonging, connection, especially considering the continued prevalence of hybrid work environments? I'd like to um, start. So um, I really admire Hans for sharing a little bit about his personal identity. That right there is a great area for companies to begin leaning into. All of us have different identities. I am a Middle Eastern woman. I am a millennial, right? What does that mean for the different individuals that I work with? How do we introduce the new generations like Gen Z into the company? How do we ensure that the boomers are feeling productive and supported by the changes in work environments? I think the biggest trend that needs to be focused on right now is having space for different identities to be able to show up. We have a value here at Blueboard. It's dance a little different. And it's everyone's favorite value uh, because it encourages the individuals to allow space for your team members, the other blue boarders that we have to show up authentically as they are. I think we have a great opportunity in the world to be able to bring, incorporate this into companies, be able to understand and recognize different identities. Pivoting a little bit to hybrid work environments, one of the parts of the future trend of acknowledging identities is let's talk about parents, for example, right? Return to office has been a really big conversation for parents. That's an identity. That is a lifestyle, right? That is a huge responsibility that I very much commend. So how are companies using that identity, aligning it with the expectations of the organization, and then being able to work with that identity to provide space for that individual, right? Are you giving space to caregivers who now need to come into the remote work environment? That right there is belonging. It's an opportunity for companies to lean into that for connection, right? So I think that using a little bit of this conversation as my, my thought behind the future trend is leaning into each of your team members as individuals, understanding, okay, we have everyone that has a different identity, has a different lifestyle out of work, how do we create space for that in this environment? Because I also don't want to take away from the fact that we are in a business environment, most of us, right? And we do need to lead with that. So I think the biggest thing for me that I work through is how can I leave space for everyone's identity to show up specifically in this environment? So just that's that's my future trend. I don't, we could talk about AI, but like it intimidates me. So I'm going to stay away from that. That's another webinar. <laughs> yeah, that's a different conversation. Um, but that would be my my thought right now. Okay. Great. Thank you, Shireen. Hans, what about you? So for me, I think the biggest trend in the future will be work and life balance. I think that will be the number one necessity and the, the number one way to maintain people engage, wanting to come, et cetera. Because even when, when I hear often people saying, oh, they want me to go every day in the week, um, I already hear complaints. But also when people are fully remote, I also hear complaints. Uh, so the hybrid became this thing. I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, and it could be all of that. But if all of that you're working to the bone, uh, you are not creating that important part of having work-life balance. I think when people do work-life balance, they do give space to come back to work recharged, to connect, to talk, to be productive, to whatever. Uh, and I, I, if you ask me if every company will be able to do that, my answer is I don't know. Because to, to create work-life balance in the United States is quite complicated. I think in other countries like Brazil, like Europe, it's a little bit different. 
but I think that is actually quite important to not only build productivity, but also to build engagement and belonging. Uh, something else that comes to my mind is a lot of, uh, I don't know if you guys read the statistic, but like in a few years, the, the majority of the workforce is going to be Gen Z. And we will have to learn how to work with Gen Z people. You're going to have to learn how to adapt to certain demands that they're going to do, which, by the way, work-life balance is one of them. Uh, that will be important. Uh, actually, somebody wrote, um, if you go couture or ready to wear kind of thing to work. And that's something that I've heard a lot of complaints before. Oh, because my boss wants me to come on a full suit. And nobody sees me. I don't talk with anybody. I'm going to be behind the computer. So I'd rather just go on my sweats. Um, is that going to compromise his his work, his mentality, his this? No, but maybe, maybe it's going to make him less stressed in the morning to put his stuff up, you know, like all of that. So I do think that it's so important. Uh, another thing that I think is important is to create uh, methodologies to, to have more connection online. Uh, because online was always the way to create connection for the longest time. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, we have not been able to create those interactions effectively yet. How can I effectively create those connections online? It has not been fully established. Um, one, for example, that I recommend is having a, like an office hour that your camera's open. Uh, if anybody can just like drop in and say, hey, Hans, oh, I just want to ask you about this. Or I knew that th this was your office hour. Uh, so I just came to chat or to do whatever. Like I would do it in the office. In the office, my door would be open and somebody would just drop in to say hi. I would do the same thing every day at the same time. So then people know that consistently I can just be there, you know, even if it's to talk about nothing, it, I'm there. Um, so I do think that it could be that small step to recreate that uh, moment that you just saw each other in the corridor, you know, so... I think like those two things seems to be uh, important nowadays to create that connection, that belonging. So. I really thank you so much, Hans, and thank you, Shireen, too. I um, you also maybe unknowingly answered one of the questions that was in the Q and A, mm -hmm. which is kind of what are some specific methodologies mm -hmm. that we can use to create that type of connection or team building in, in hybrid environments. And part of what I'm hearing both of you say too is, what did we used to do in person, right? Like dropping in, or maybe there was a, a space in the office, a physical space that we used to kind of hang out in and, and talk around. How do we recreate or at least try to mimic some of that um, in how we are engaging online or see if that works, right? Nothing is going to be perfect. And to your point, Hans, we're still learning so much, mm -hmm. but I love the idea um, that when we think about future trends, that we really have to reconsider that the way that we did things may just not work as well anymore. And we have to get creative around figuring out what's most important to the people inside of our companies and to our company culture as well. I just um, added an office yeah. hours to my calendar. It's like oh, such yeah. a good idea. I've seen, this is the first company I've worked at that has started to do office hours. And like we recently did an office hours after rolling out our performance management program. But what it, I like, quite frankly, I struggle working from home. I'm an extrovert and my boyfriend and I were laughing over the past couple of days. He's like, Shereen, you haven't talked to me in five days. And it's cause we're, it's cloudy over here and I've been, I'm in a bad mood. I went into the office yesterday and happened to be there for a full day and I came home singing and like I genuinely am an extrovert and so other than the cats keeping me company I'm stuck to this room so this idea of office hours where I can just put time on my calendar and someone can pop in I like I need that for me so I think it's such an incredible idea. Yes. And it just illustrates so much of what we've been talking about here, that the connection is so critical, even in those moments when we think that hunkering down and staying in our own space is what's best for us. We do, when we have opportunities to have that connection with others, it can create such a shift in how we are viewing things, our perspective and how we're working and how we're engaging. So thank you for sharing that personal anecdote. Sure. Um, 
I know we are coming so close to time here. I would love to, we have just a couple of um, questions in the Q&A that I want to ask. Um, if, and if we don't have answers today, I am going to share these um, with my colleagues at Bravely and Blueboard so that we can make sure that um, we can direct you to the right resources. One, uh, one question was, what type of quantitative data and research can you share that validates sense of belonging has a positive impact on productivity? And I'm going to let you know that I did share that with my colleagues at Bravely and Blueboard. So we will share out any additional resources um, with regard to research and data. Um, what is the best approach to sell this type of employee engagement strategies into the workplace? I know people are going to leave this webinar hopefully excited to try implementing some of these things, maybe to share information um, around how to increase connection and engagement. What advice do you have for people to maybe sell this um, into the organization or help understand the importance of this? I think having that data is going to be a really important. And I, I know Blueboard will push this out, but we've done a lot of research around appreciation, recognition, and the exact correlation that it has to productivity. So I know that'll circulate, like you have the data, but where I'm at right now is you have to believe in it. You have to, as the, as I don't know the appropriate term, but as the champion for this type of program, you really have to believe that this program is going to bring value to your organization. And the mix of belief, the mix of passion behind it, along with the data that shows that it does increase productivity, that right there is your cell. You hear someone who's excited enough about something and then has the data to back it, it's hard to look at that and say no. Also because with Blueboard in particular, it's a huge emotional aspect to the business, we're looking at experiential rewards. So there's a big emotional piece to this. And so anytime that I'm trying to position something to the organization, I'm speaking about the emotion that's incited inside of me, which most of the time is passion. And that just shows organically. Um, but that, that will get buy-in right? We're human beings. And like that sometimes gets slipped in these types of conversations, especially when we're talking about data, but like we are emotional beings, whether we express it or not. So if you believe in what you're doing and you channel what you're doing and you enjoy what you're doing and you believe in the strength and opportunity it can bring to those around you, and then you have the data to back it, it's hard to look at that and be like, no, not for me, you know? So I do think it's this like, this pretty blend between feeling passionate, believing in what you're doing and what you're recommending with having that data to support that decision. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say that there is a data that was released, I think it was either 2016, 2017 uh, by the US government saying that uh, managers uh, weekly, the, the weekly time of a manager was 70% dealing with conflicts. <laughs> So the, the, whoever is a manager here, 70% of your time is dealing with conflicts. Yeah. Uh, and then I, when I heard that, I was like, wait, so the other, so they are basically only working 30% because 70% <laughs> is just dealing with stuff, stuff with noise, with stuff that may not even be related to your job. Um, but and then like when you read you read more and more and more and more about the the report, you realize that it's seventy percent because people are feeling unappreciated. People are feeling uh, unrecognized. People are complaining that nobody said this and nobody that did that. Nobody. So in the end, it was like, oh wow. So it's it's that's why a lot of managers don't have time to do their job because they have to be dealing with people's personality, people's uh, sense of self, sense of belonging. And I, I believe it's very important to be able to let that go, you know, and just recognize and do that. However, I have to say something about uh, recognition. Recognition to an extrovert and to an introvert, I personally will do it differently. To an introvert, I will do privately. To an extrovert, I'm going to do publicly. So if it is in a meeting, I'm going to say, hey, Shireen, just, I just want to say, guys, the Shireen really rocked. And then because it was in a public setting. But if she was introvert, I wouldn't do the same because a lot of introverts when in the public setting, they feel uh, not very happy about that. Yes. And I, um, and I want to tie that back. Thank you both. I want to tie that back to one more um, 
question here, any resources on helping employees self-reflect individually, which is to, it's at the core of what we're talking about here. We have to be able to understand what's important to ourselves to be able to connect and be, and ask for recognition or understand what recognition and connection will be most meaningful to us. Bravely is an incredible resource. Hans and I have both talked about the value of coaching and providing that objective perspective to be able to, whether it's a manager having those conversations or an HR leader or an outside resource um, like Bravely, it's so critical to really ensure that people have the space to reflect on something and say, hmm, how did that feel when Hans shared the recognition in the meeting? Yeah, that was really great. And I'd like, I'd like more of that. So absolutely taking, um, creating spaces for that self-reflection is really critical. Um, and I'm going to answer one more, the advice or ideas on making sure international employees feel an extra level of support and appreciation. I know Blueboard, both Blueboard and Bravely are global organizations. I know Blueboard has a wide variety of inclusive recognition ideas. Um, and so I am going to, in a moment, we'll put up the Blueboard slide. We'll share a little bit more. And while I'm doing that, um, someone asked about the free card link. I already see some people in the chat have already started using the cards, um, which I think is so wonderful. Um, so we'll put that in the chat for you. Yes, we are going to be sending out this presentation. We're so grateful that everyone is here. Um, this is a little bit more. You can scan that QR code to learn a little bit more about Bravely. We are a training and coaching platform that supports employees in developing and applying so important the skills that they need to succeed at work. And we know that that fuels individual transformation and organizational growth. It's critical to everything we've been talking about here today. And Blueboard, if you didn't know, now you do, is an employee recognition incentives platform powered by hand curated experiences in home, out in the world, so many different options tailored to the needs of individuals. Wonderful. So again, um, if you are joining us today and you are interested in a SHRM credit, this is the code you can use for an HRCI credit. That's the code you can use. We are so, so grateful for everyone who has joined us today, all uh, through over 300, almost 400 of you. So thank you so much um, and stay tuned for some of the resources from today's webinar, which will show up in your emails. Thank you, Hans. And thank you, Shireen. You all have been wonderful. Of course. Thanks, thank Natalie, for everything. Hans, again, great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.